Today I'm going to be walking you through the first three parts of the soil sluice lab provided by Kansas Corn Stem. Hi, my name is Jessica Sadler and I'm a sixth grade science teacher at Oregon Trail Middle School in Olathe, Kansas. Today we're going to be going over the soil sluice lab provided by Kansas Corn Stem. Let's get started. Okay. The first thing you'd want to do is starting with a phenomena picture, or I like to start with question-based teaching. So I would show the students this picture and I would ask them, what questions do you have about this particular picture? You're going to get a lot of various results. If you ask them things that they'll notice, you'll probably come up with things like, I see something that looks maybe like water, I see birds, a telephone pole. All of those things are completely valid and you just kind of brainstorm for the pace of the room and let them come up with as many questions as they have for that particular slide. Next, you would follow up with a second picture and a little bit of a different verbiage where you would ask them, what observations can you now make about this image? So they've already gone through their questioning part, but now they're kind of looking a little bit more in detail about things that they notice. You may hear things like that water pattern, now that they can see there's water, looks very similar to the shape that we saw in the previous image. Those are kind of some of the ideas that you're looking for in this. Okay. Thoughts on soil. So the first thing that you might want to work with your students on is what is soil? Because soil and dirt are very different things. When we're talking about soil, we're talking about minerals, we're talking about air, water, living and decaying things. How is soil different from dirt? Dirt is something that has been disassociated from its ecosystem. When we're thinking about it in that fashion, it might be dirt when it's under your fingernails or on your clothes. How is soil formed? Soil is formed from the weathering of its parent material, and in this case, that's primarily going to be rocks. And then we move on to what can be found in soil, and this is going to be pretty much word for word the same thing as what is soil. So you're going to find um, a lot of minerals, air, and that living and decaying matter, as well as water. The earth as an apple, this can be done by bringing in a physical apple into your classroom if you prefer, and you would cut it to the um, measurements that are shown on the S1 worksheet. However, there's also a video version of it if you'd like to use that too, and it covers the idea that the skin of the apple is really all the topsoil that we have for farmland and growing on our planet. Next, you're going to be looking at S2. So when we're looking at S2, you would ask your students, I like to have them use two different colored pencils. So you would start and you would have them pick up a blue colored pencil and ask them what they think are at least five common or essential nutrients or elements that humans need to survive. You're gonna get things like oxygen, hopefully, uh, carbon, water, hydrogen. Then you'll repeat the same process having them switch to a green colored pencil, and you're gonna ask them the exact same question, but this time we're asking about plants. You'll come up with a lot of the same things, but ideally they're gonna pull in some answers like phosphorus, potassium, and then ideally you'll still have carbon and oxygen and such as well. Then you'll move on to having them either by themselves or with their classmates come up with a definition for what is an essential nutrient, what really makes a whole encompassing idea for how you could present that to someone. And then finally below that, you will talk about based on the definition, they're going to be drawing a picture of what a plant may or may not look like if it's missing or has all of those essential nutrients within it. Okay. And then we move on to the dry soil mystery. What you'll wanna do is you will like want to have a potting soil, a local soil, and a sand. And I put them in containers that are labeled A, B, and C. That way you're not giving up the mystery. So let me grab those. The cup size doesn't really matter. You want to make sure that you have enough that they can kind of look at, dump a little out, manipulate it with their hands. So I'm using these smaller portion size cups. That way I can Sharpie on the outside and they're easy to clean up. 
So with this, they'll repeat the same processes for all three soil types. We're just gonna cover one today. So I have my B soil here. So I'm gonna look at it and I'm gonna come up with the color of it. And anything that I record as an observation, I would put in the B column. Does the sample have an odor? You can teach them a wafting technique, or maybe they get a little bit closer. Either one would be completely fine. You're asking them if the soil feels gritty, so they're gonna put their fingers in it and kind of do a little bit of a finger test with that. Are there any visible particles or grains? This is a great time to give them a hand lens if you have that, or they can also dump a little bit out and kind of spread it out. It makes it a little easier to see. You'll add 20 milliliters of water. I have it pre-measured out here. You can use beakers, graduated cylinders, whatever you have. So I would pour it in and they would get to a chance to kind of stick it in there and feel what that little bit of water does to the composition and texture of the soil. Moving down, um, you'll ask if it seems to be clay or sand, and then you'll also do a little bit of a ribbon test with them. So they would take the soil and dump it into their hands or take a small amount. You wanna kinda of have them squeeze the excess water out, and then they're going to take it and kind of make a ball and then push it through with their thumb, and they're seeing if it kind of stays together and makes more of a ribbon-like structure, or if it just crumbles and falls apart like what you might get with this sand. So ideally, you're gonna have them go through all three steps, or all three soils, all of the steps and it's pretty pretty easy and they enjoy it a lot. When you get to the um, finished with that you'll move on to the dry soil investigation. Something that I like to talk about if you're having them create and choose their own samples is the difference between a representative sample versus a non-representative sample. There is a soil sampling guide in here. The biggest point is that they understand if you're taking a soil example or a representation that you want to pick multiple different spots to get a good idea of what the soil is like in that area, particularly with your local soil. Something that I would do is take cones or rulers or something and stake out different areas so you don't have them all clustering to the same place. They get a little spread out so you're truly getting a better sample size. Okay. With the dry soil investigation, we're going to take one teaspoon of potting soil and one teaspoon of the local soil and place it on these worksheets. It's S4 and S5 in the student documents. So I would take a little teaspoon of this and I have a main place to pour it. And so when I'm looking at this, I'm really sorting for animal matter, plant matter, what would be constituted as rocks. And then there is a column for, I don't really know what this is, I'm kind of uncertain, so that they have a place to put it. This is another really great opportunity if you have hand lenses or magnifying glasses to get those out. It really helps see some of those better particles and smaller items better. So for here, I'm gonna look, I have definitely an example of plant matter in here. I've got some root systems going on. This is my local soil. So I'd move this up into that space. I might get closer and see that I've got some pretty good rock sized particles that are easy to identify as rocks. I even have an ant, so sometimes that'll happen. You might get a worm or two in there, so anything that feels comfortable, you give them a certain time frame, and you're gonna allow them to go ahead and sort those into what they by themselves or their group thinks is a good match. You can also provide a piece of clear packing tape once it's mostly sorted, and they can actually stick that over, and it'll hold the majority of those things in place um, if you'd like to look at it again later. So they'll not only do that with their local soil as well as their potting soil and the paper pages for that look the same exact same process for both. Okay. Next we're going to move on to the soil and airspace investigation. So you're going to need page S7 in the student worksheets. It says that you'll need 50 milliliter test tubes. Honestly, if you have anything that has the ability to measure 50 milliliters, you're in great shape. So I'm using graduated cylinders. You're gonna to wanna to put 20 milliliters of the appropriate soil into your container. You can label them with post-its. Sometimes those get wet or they can come untaped. So it's totally fine to use a Sharpie and mark at the bottom. And then if you want it to come off later, just take an Expo marker and rub off on it and it wipes right off. Okay, so I've got potting soil my sand, and a local soil. Something that you'll want your, to have your students do before they start to add in the water is to kind of knock it against their hand or a table to make sure that it completely settles and you don't have a lot of air particles in there taking up wasted space in your 20 milliliters. 
I already have 20 milliliters of water measured out. This will take a little longer probably in your classroom. So after that's done, I'll knock it down, make sure that it's totally at 20 milliliters, and then I'm gonna come up and mark two times that height. On these, it's pretty easy because they're already labeled, so I went up to 40 and made a Sharpie line for myself. It tends to be a little bit easier to see. So these have already all been done for that. I'm gonna take the 20 milliliters of extra water and add those in. That one's empty. <laughs> awesome. You can have your students set a timer for, I probably wouldn't say longer than a minute because they can get distracted, but it helps kind of have a chance to settle on them as much as they're going to settle. And then you're gonna have them record some observations. So you'll have some groups that will say things like they can see that they use have a clearly stacked layer pattern where I can see the soil underneath and then a good amount of water resting on top of that versus for the potting soil they're probably going to have some observations of I can't see it, um, it soaked in, I can kind of like pick it up and wiggle it but it really kind of becomes almost hard to tell that it's in that one and all of those are important things for them to note and totally okay. And then after you would have them look into this, you're going to ask them which you think would be most appropriate for plant growth, specifically corn. And so they'll look at it and this requires them to kind of have, okay, man, that one soaked up a lot. This one doesn't seem to absorb as much. This one seems to kind of be a nice middle ground for it. So they're kind of making these decisions on what they think would be best. Let them record whatever it is they think, whatever they discuss as a group, take all those notes, and then it's a great opportunity to have a class discussion about what, what they thought, what they shared, and then um, clear up any misconceptions in that space. Next, we would move on to S8. That is the Soil and Water Worksheet title. Okay. Or S8 and S9, excuse me. So when you're looking at there, it starts out with the problem of which type of soil will retain the most amount of water. In this, it has an example or three circles, and it's gonna ask the students to make some detailed observations. Again, a great time for a hand lens or an opportunity to spread it out for closer inspection. And they're just gonna draw kind of like what they would see on a microscope slide, a vision of what it looks like. I would encourage them to add color uh, that's appropriate, um, as detailed as they can be. There's a space underneath for them to write any extra things that they notice that maybe don't show up in the drawing um, due to their art skills or it was just something that is better to explain in words. You'll then have them create a hypothesis for which soil they think will absorb or retain the most amount of water before they do anything else. After S8 is complete, they'll move on to the procedure for the lab on S9. They're going to need three graduated cylinders again. You can use post-its or you can use, label them use that Sharpie method. They're going to place a filter in the top of the graduated cylinder as well as a coffee filter, so a funnel and a coffee filter. So we've got that there. You'll take a cup of each kind of soil and you're going to place it in the top right in that filter. Something I like to do is I like to have multiple buckets of the three kinds of soil or containers around the room so they're not all kind of trying to get from the same one because it can cause a traffic jam. Okay. Once this part is set up, you can have groups, or if you have students working alone, they can do all three of them alone or get them all base set up like this. If you have them working in groups, it's a really nice opportunity to give each student their own setup that they're in charge of, so that way everybody has something to do. Once it looks like this, you're going to take 120 milliliters of water and you're going to do a slow pour 
ideally as close to the center as you can get. Really important to let students know that if they pour too fast, they're gonna have an overflow and they're probably gonna have to start over. So it doesn't matter which one you start with, but you're gonna try to find that center mark and you're just gonna do a slow pour of 120 milliliters of water. As soon as that water is out of your main pour vessel, you'll want to start a timer for four minutes. All right, now that we have put water in all three and waited four minutes, you can start to see some of the results taking place. What you would want your students to do next is we know that we poured 120 milliliters into each one. So they're going to take that amount and then look to measure the amount of difference that they have as far as what made it through. So if I were going to do this local soil example, I'm going to get to where I can see and it looks like about 76 milliliters passed through the filter and the local soil. So what you would have your students do is take that 120 milliliters that we started with, minus 76, and they would put that into the sheet right here. So it has that set up for them where we've got amount, minus what was collected, and this is how much was retained within that soil. Okay. There are some follow-up questions that they would answer after. I would probably have them answer them again as individuals or groups, but definitely go over them with the whole class. There'll be a lot of surprising results where you'll have students say things like, I really thought it was going to be this one because, and it's a great time to have that conversation and further their knowledge and clear up again any misconceptions that they may have. And then last, we are going to move on to mud watts. We've got a couple different things that we're going to cover with these. So a great place to start is the idea we know from earlier talking and worksheets and such that a lot of plants get their essential nutrients from soil, but those aren't the only things that can be found in the soil. So this is a great extender lesson to those ideas. Microbes are present and they must be present to have a healthy soil. What is a microbe? Microbes are short for microorganisms, and they're tiny life forms that are much too small to be seen with the naked eye. They can be virus, bacteria, or fungus. They often are given a bad rap because they can cause disease and illness, but they are essential for nutrient recycling. Meet Shui. Shui is the abbreviated name that Mudwatts will use in a lot of the curriculum that you see. It's a very friendly way to explain this particular microorganism to students. It's an environmentally friendly bacteria that can consume toxins like radioactive waste and petroleum spills. They're found all over the earth, even in ocean sediment and to tops of mountains. They metabolize metals and release electrons through nanowires, and they're actually being researched by NASA to potentially aid in future space travel. Next, you'll also be working with Geobacter, or Geo. It's an environmentally friendly bacteria, again. It thrives in anaerobic environments. It metabolizes iron, sugars, and nutrients, and also releases electrons through nanowires. So, how does a microbial fuel cell work? Well, that is a mudwatt. You're going to have a vessel that looks something like this, and you'll have a container that goes on top of it. The the big piece that we want to create is an airtight seal that helps with the recycling process to keep everything going. So this would be the vessel that you're going to be working with. Okay. It's a device that uses natural metabolisms of the microbes in the soil to make an electrical energy. Okay. There are graphite electrodes, so I'll pull those out for you. You have an anode and a cathode. The anode is going to be the thinner pad of graphite and your cathode is going to be a little bit thicker. And you also have wires that are going to go into these, but we'll cover that in just a second. Okay. The microbes develop on the anode and then they end up cycling up. So these aspire sugar and the nutrients in the soil and deposit electrons and carbon and to the, or deposit electrons onto the anode, excuse me. Protons and carbon are released into the soil and they're going to travel up in a vertical pattern through the use of the wire. 
then they will cycle at the top and it's going to end up producing a blink from an LED light that will be connected and it cycles back in to the cathode which will create a moisture and that moisture will release down into the soil and it helps recycle the process over. This will continue as long as you have healthy microbes and an airtight seal. There are student worksheets to accompany this. However, there are um, instructions on how to set up your mud watt in the booklet that comes with your kit. It looks like this and it's probably the best way to start the setup. So it begins on page two, and what we're going to run through is you'll take your vessel. You're going to want about, it does have centimeter markings on the side. You're going to want to put about a centimeter of soil in there. The blacker, the smellier, the darker, the better the soil is. And you're going to get results a lot quicker if you choose that kind of soil versus something that might be a little bit more dry or lighter. If it's too dry, it's just not going to work. So you'll want to get it. And I always have students put it in, press it in really well to about that one centimeter mark. If you're a little over, it's not the big, biggest thing in the world. And then slowly, maybe through pipettes, or if they tend to be pretty experienced, they're going to have a little water added to it and then kind of continue to smash it around, flatten it out again. You don't want it too soupy, but you also can't have it too dry. So it's a really fine balance. I often find it easiest if you have buckets or bowls to have the soil in my hand and do a really fast kind of like dunk and then bring it up and put it in and flatten it around that way. That tends to get it just right, um, but you know your students best, so whatever would work for that way. After I have that one inch of potting so or local soil or whatever soil I'm using, potting soil probably isn't preferred because of all the excess material in there. It can plug things up and it leaves too many air pockets, so it's not the best choice. So this would be ideally wet, it would be smashed into that space, and I've got about a centimeter, so that looks pretty good. I would set that down to the side. I'm gonna pick up my anode and my green wire. You'll notice that on the wire, one side sticks out quite a bit further than the other side. The longer sticking out side is what's actually going to go into this graphite padding. You'll wanna bend it ideally kind of like at a 90 degree angle, so get it in a nice L shape, and you're gonna insert this wire into the padding. I think it's kind of difficult to get it this way, so what I like to do is turn the pad sideways and slide it in, and that tends to get better results because you wanna make sure that the wire doesn't poke out of the padding. Sometimes you'll start to feel it come out a little bit, so you pull it out and you can just start it again. It's not a big deal. So once I have that put in there and it looks something like this, I'm going to lay it on top of that wet but not too wet soil. And I have my setup to here so far. Okay. At this point, I'm going to fill about another ooh, probably four more centimeters right up to that five mark of that same texture of soil. Not too wet, but pretty, pretty damp, ready to go, compacted and pressed in there. You're not going to want to fill it up past the six or higher because you really need a good air pocket in there. If you don't have a solid air pocket, you can tamper with your results and potentially make your mud watt not very effective. All right, so I'm using the local soil again, and I've got it here. Your students don't need to worry about going in, and you wouldn't want them to, going in and pulling out like any grass or pieces of plant matter. Uh, I just kind of tell them to smush it in there good and leave it. Uh, if you had huge rock chunks or something like that, feel free to take those out, but the plant matter, it doesn't need to be um, siphoned through to take anything out. So once I have it like this, I'm gonna set it to the side again. I'm gonna pick up the cathode, so it has the orange wire, same setup, except this graphite pad is a little larger, so it's easier to put the wire through. I'm gonna bend it to an L shape. It does tell you in the instructions that you can wear nitrile gloves, which I have some here. And if you have enough for your students to use them, that's awesome. If you don't, you should still be able to get just fine results, and I'll show you one here in a second, and I didn't use the gloves, and it worked out. So. If that is something that you don't have access to, you can totally still work on this. Okay. So I'd have the same similar kind of setup, and I'm going to place it on top of where I've been working. 
So at the end, I should have something like this. I still have about ooh, a centimeter's worth of an air pocket, which is pretty good, and this is ready to go. I'm gonna take the airtight sealing lid, and you'll notice it has two holes in the front. So I'm gonna slide those wires through as I put the lid on. And it's okay if you have to bend them a little to make it work, just as long as you don't accidentally pull them out. And Then I'm going to get a good seal on my container so I've got it all closed up and the two wires are sticking out at the top. I'm going to come into, typically it should be in a small gray um, silver kind of packaging. These have the other three parts that we're going to need. All right, so I've got a hacker board, an LED light, and a capacitor. And if you wanted, you could always switch this out to a larger LED light once your student has a, a better producing microbial fuel cell and see if it can power something that's larger. I don't recommend starting with anything larger than this because um, it could potentially take a good amount of time to get it going. So I'm going to take the hacker board and I'm going to place it. It has a cutout spot on the lid. So I'm going to place that there for myself. Orange wire plugs into the positive side and it is labeled, so I'm just going to bend it as best I can and put it in there. I try to tell them they want to make a skinny rainbow. If you've got a bunch of divots and things, you might have to straighten it out and go again. And your green wire is going to plug into the negative side. And that does matter, so you may want to have them have a buddy check their work or you take time to go around and check their work. Then you're going to put in your next piece, the capacitor. So there should be one side that is slightly longer than the other. What I tell my students, and I help myself remember, is that the long side goes on the left. So I'm gonna look, and these are numbered, so in the one and two spot, that's where this piece is going to go. I'm gonna find the side that is longer than the other, and I'm gonna make sure that it plugs in on the left side, or the odd numbered side, whichever is easiest for your students to remember. And you're just gonna get it in there where it feels pretty snug. You don't want tons of wiggle. Some of them, the long side is really long. It is okay to bend that up a little bit. You'll see that in my demonstration, or the one that I set up. Um, you're not gonna hurt anything. So you just kinda wanna pull it up a little bit so that you can get both sides in there snugly. And then you're gonna come to your LED light. Again, same setup. The long side goes on the left, or the odd numbered side. The short side goes on the even side, and your LED light is going to go in spaces five and six, so the very front holes. I'm going to get that in there nice and snug. So a quick rundown, orange goes on the positive side, green goes on the negative side. Those are your two back spaces. Your next ones, the capacitor goes in one and two, and then all the way down at the bottom in five and six, you'll have your LED light. Okay, three and four don't have anything in them right now. And it is done and ready to go. So this is one that I set up. This is a functioning one. You can see that the LED light is blinking on it right now. I had a neighbor that was doing some construction, so went across the street and scooped up the soil from where they had excavated, and I had this one working in less than 24 hours. So typically they can take about three to seven days. It just depends on the quality of soil that you put in it. But if you can find something like that or you're willing to dig pretty deep in there to get the good stuff, you can have these up and running fairly quickly, okay? So again, I've got that rainbow kind of look. If you can notice my wires, do have that bend in it because my longer side happened to be really long so I just kind of hiked it up a little bit so I could get both in there and I had to do it on the capacitor and the LED light and it's just fine okay so this is ready to go and it has been producing for the last I would think four or five days now um, if you have trouble or if you want, you're more than welcome to put them in kind of a warmer place and a lot of times that can help. So once it's set up and it actually has a producing piece to it, so the LED light is going, that's telling me that my microbes are producing that electrical current. There is an app. It works on Apple products. It works on Google products, Android products. It's called MudWatts. So when you go, the app looks kind of green and mud-like actually, and it says mud watt. So I click on that. 
and you're going to come to the Mudwatt Explorer app screen. Okay, on this screen you have the Discover option. So if I click that, it takes them through an animated comic. You can only go so far in the comic, and again, it's using those names, Shui and Geo. They have them created as fun characters. My students really enjoy it, even though they're in middle school, they love it. It's not too little for them. And eventually you'll come to a point in the comic where it will no longer let you go any further because your mudwatt has to have produced a certain amount to be able to continue. So it tells you how much that would be in microwatts and how much microbes would be produced to make you go on to the next part of that comic. So that's the first step. There's also the measure step. Okay. When you do the measure step, you're going to have a square that's produced on the screen. It's a little hard to see unless you're holding the device. You're going to center the LED light within that square. I like to teach my students to kind of use like a pipetting method or to pick something that already has a stand on it or if they have like a tripod device, something like that, because you have to be a pretty steady hand. So I'm going to center up the mud watch to where it's best. I like to kind of brace my hands, and I'm really trying to get that LED light centered in that space. That square is going to turn a green color, and as soon as it changes green, you hold, and it is actually recording your energy, okay, or what you're producing. After that happens, it'll give you some kind of graph, like, congratulations, you've produced four microwatts. That's the equivalent of, and it gives them a real world connection to think, wow, that thing I just did, that's as actually as tall as the Eiffel Tower is one of the examples that you could use. After you have measured, you can go to the Analyze button, and you can see data that your mudwatt has collected. So on July 16th, at about noon, one o'clock, I was producing four microwatts. I went back a little bit later and did it again just to show that it is fairly consistent in its measurement. So I went back a couple minutes later, I got four again. I waited till way later in the afternoon. It had went up to five. The next day I had produced up to 10, then 11, 11, and your data, you can continue to scroll down. So for me, this orange plot right here is all of the data that I've collected off of this microwatt or my uh, mud watt, excuse me. I also have data from a previous time and it will show that on the same graph, but it populates it in different colors for you so you know what you're looking at, which is pretty neat. Something that I have students do is take big sheets of the post-it paper, or like the sticky post-its or butcher paper, it doesn't matter, and they can actually hand create their graph. That way all hours can see what's happening and they can compare their results to their classmates a little bit more easily because they might not have access to their graph or app. Um, there is in the PowerPoint a setup video that runs through everything that I just talked about. If you would like to look at something like that, that's an option as well. For troubleshooting, there is a slide that kind of covers that. The biggest thing I can't express enough is the quality of soil that you're putting in there. So that friendly reminder that if it's a darker in color, especially if it's odorous, if you have a lake or a river or any place that maybe like mosquitoes are collecting, which aren't super friendly, those would be the soils that you would want to put in here. If you're having trouble that three to seven days, really it can take that long. It's a great idea to maybe if you have an incubation system or some way, hot towels, whatever the case may be, if you can kind of wrap them up, depending on the time of year you're doing it, even if you put it outside, heat really helps get them going pretty quickly, okay? There are some extensions for it. Other things that you could do, um, you can do temperature control. So that same idea of maybe your medwatt is producing, but you want to test some extra variables. You could have your students make their own, what they think would create additional heat. Maybe they get field corn and they make some kind of packaging, whatever, heat packs, all of it. That can be something that you manipulate. You can also manipulate humidity, um, the control of the humidity and what impact that might have depends on if you have a multimeter to use for that. Um, they're very easy to plug in. If that's not something you have access to, it probably wouldn't work super well. You can create different batches of mud. So ha maybe having students bring it from their own house instead of collecting it at school, or maybe they go to a local place that's near their house, maybe they live by a lake and another student might not. That's a great way to do it. You can also have students add different things like maybe some sh finely shred newspaper or add some extra decomposing element, more than okay. So that's a fun thing to do. Um, if you have, I covered the multimeter part, you can also have them calculate um, peak 
power performance. So you could have, oh, we all set this up together, but for some reason this one seems to be producing a lot more, and maybe it's just a difference in setup. Maybe they left a better air pocket. Um, maybe there's a sealed a little bit tighter, so you can kind of get into some of those things if you've made them all the same way, but one tends to be producing better than the other. Uh, you can also do an extension or a competition if you felt like it for which group could get furthest in the comic. The fastest would be something or an easy way to use it in the classroom as well. And then MudWatts does provide additional curriculum. They are free. The links are right here. It's free use, free everything. So the first one is an initial microbe knowledge. These extra curriculums do have pre and post and vocabulary quizzes and things like that that you can use. The second module they have is on electricity and circuits. You can actually take MudWatts however many vessels you have, and you can use alligator clips, and you can actually chain them together to get a bigger production. Um, you can connect, I think the largest amount I've ever done is up to six, but you could always try more than that. So getting into the circuits and electricity. And then the last module they have is on soil ecology and nutrient cycling. And again, all of those are free and pretty, um, pretty helpful to continue your, ex you, your experience with MedBots. Thank you so much for tuning in today. All of the information is available at kansascornstem.com. You can find this PowerPoint and a lot of other additional resources to use in your classroom.